All right, so I think we'll we'll get started now. Um, my name is Michal Rauscher. Can everybody hear me okay? Great, okay, wonderful. So uh, my name is Michal Rauscher. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Adult Ed Committee. I am going to be just introducing this four-part series and getting everybody um, started. And then I'm gonna turn it over to my uh, my colleague, my partner in crime, the other one of the other co-chairs, um, Dennis Klein, who uh, will introduce our speaker for the evening. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind everybody to please put their um, computers on mute, put their Zooms on mute. Um, we will make sure to do it for you if you forget, but, but um, <laughs> we'd like you to uh, try to take care of it uh, yourself. As you know, we've all become very accustomed to this already, but you know, all the background noise can be very distracting for those of us trying to listen to the speaker. So uh, the mute button is our friend here. Um, at the end, we will have uh, some Q&A. Um, and during that time, of course, you'll be able to unmute and, and we'll all be able to hear these glorious voices. Um, so we are very, very fortunate that um, Dr. Mona Fishbane um, suggested this series for us, actually. Um, we've all probably over the last eight weeks had, um, you know, Zoom events that we felt could have been much better, would have been much better in person. Um, you know, we've been to, I was at a baby naming on Sunday over Zoom, uh, which as glorious as it was, you know, felt like it was lacking. Um, we've been to Shiva calls, unfortunately, over Zoom, maybe funerals, um, maybe community healing events that as great as they, as, as satisfying as they can be right now, they are the best that we can do. There's something lacking. And um, over this four part series, we're gonna be talking about what it means to connect in this different way. So the, the series is called, We Are Wired to Connect, Insights from Jewish Tradition, Psychology and Neurobiology. And I'm just gonna read for you to remind us all to get us into the right headspace how the sessions have been described in our publicity. The condition of separateness untethers the bond that is so vital to well being. It invites feelings of loss and loneliness. As we self isolate and migrate to digital platforms, can connectivity compensate for connection? Our present circumstances are surely a test of the human capacity to bear loneliness, but are they also a test of the human capacity for resilience? Jewish tradition reminds us that mourning is not melancholy. How can Jewish tradition help us learn from this inflection point about what is essential in our lives and in our relationships with others? How can it help us to sustain community and kindle possibilities even as we endure another day of remoteness? So this is a four part series. Tonight, we're gonna to hear from Dr. Mona Fishbane. Next week, mark your calendars for Rabbi Iska Waldman. After that, on June 1st, Rabbi Eliezer Diamond and on June 8th, Rabbi Pitkowski. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Dennis, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Michal, much appreciated. Um, just a uh, footnote on the origins of the series. I actually would think we should give credit to Joe Lepore, who many of you may know as a writer for The New Yorker. And actually the seed of this series occurred to Mona as we begin to talk to each other about what we both recognize in her article as something quite profound. In fact, it even occurred to me at one time, at one point, to invite Jill Lepore to join us. I'm sure she would have a few things to say about what we're about to talk about during this series. But basically, her article really was about um, the condition of loneliness uh, in America. And um, she did it historically, which is certainly why it appealed to me. Uh, she makes the case briefly, but I think again, quite compellingly, that this culture of individualism that you and I prize, um, for that we pay a rather significant price. 
uh, we have lost, she argues, a sense of or even an obligation for community. And going through what we're all going through right now, it certainly, just as Mikhail had indicated here, raises the question of whether connectivity can compensate for connection. And I think we're all at some level or another really thinking through our own um, priorities, how much we do value our own, we can do it ourselves independence, and yet recognizing how strong and powerful the idea of community is. And on that basis, given our own Jewish tradition and how deeply you and I go as Jews into our sense of obligation for community, we thought it would be actually a, a very um, enlightening series to invite four speakers, presenters, to explore some of these questions from the Jewish, um, within a Jewish framework. So I am really quite delighted and frankly honored to introduce our first presenter known to all of you, with the exception perhaps of Eitan. We'll have to figure out how much we really know each other here. Uh, Mona Fishbane is a clinical psychologist and former director of couple therapy training at the Chicago Center for Family Health. In addition to her clinical practice, Mona teaches and writes on couple therapy, neurobiology, and intergenerational family relationships. Mona received the 2017 Family Psychologist of the Year Award from the American Psychological Association. Her book, Loving with the Brain in Mind, Neurobiology and Couple Therapy, was published by Norton in 2013. She is particularly interested in the intersection between Jewish values and psychology. In recent years, she has been co-leading with Toby Glick, Wise Aging Groups at the JCC of the Palisades. With that, Mona, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thank you. Um, everybody can hear me? Yes? So a couple, a couple of, of corrections. Um, it's not just Eitan who's on this call, it's also my son, Alicia. So um, I don't think both of my sons have ever been together at one of my talks, which is very cool for me. And it's one of the actual perks of Zoom. The other correction I wanna make is how the series actually got, got cooked up. Um, Dennis called me and said, have you read the article by Joe Lepore? And I had, but I had sort of forgotten. I had partly read it and put it aside as I sometimes do with the New Yorker. And he really sparked, um, there's a spark in our conversation around this that was um, very exciting. And so um, Dennis and I cooked this up together. I didn't create it out of, my, out of my head. It was actually Dennis who started the whole thing. So, um, but, but we're really excited about this and I'm very honored to be the first um, op to open this up and, um, and to share with you some thoughts about, uh, I'm gonna really f focus on both psychology and neurobiology of connection and, uh, and isolation, but also, look at um, some of the Jewish values. And then the three following speakers will be focusing really at more in, in depth on Jewish texts around connection and isolation in the rabbinic world. So um, social distancing, as many people have noted, uh, the first time I heard this, I think it was, I don't know, it was, it was a rabbi who said it, who really spoke to me, is really, it's, it's not social distancing, it's physical distancing and social connection. So that during this period of quarantine, people have really been hungry for connection and our use of Zoom has Zoomed. Um, I've been using Zoom for years. I, I do therapy by Zoom since we moved here. I teach by Zoom, I learn by Zoom, but everyone's doing Zoom now. Zoom therapy, Zoom education, Zoom happy hours, Zoom davening, some people did Zoom seders. Um, our yearning for connection has never been more clear. Imagine being in this pandemic without internet, or without connectivity that we have. I mean, can you imagine being, which was the case in prior epidemics where you were stuck in your house and you couldn't, you had no idea if your loved ones were alive or dead and you and no one maybe knew if you were. Um, our bond is strong, but we struggle with the distance. Um, we miss the in-person hugs and many of, my, many of my friends are grandparents and they're missing the hugs. And I think the younger generations are missing the hugs as well. Um, so we're gonna look at the pluses and minuses of the ways we connect in our new reality online. And we're not sure how long this is gonna last. What are the challenges of being alone? How do we manage in isolation? What are we learning? And that's gonna be a major theme for me tonight. What are we learning from all this? Um, so also from the cultural point of view, what are Jewish values around connection and community as opposed to what, what was referenced earlier, I think, by Dennis in terms of the, the, uh, the dominant uh, view of individualism. 
So Judaism values community and connection both horizontally and vertically. And I actually have a PowerPoint, uh, which I'm going to share with you. So I'm going to go now to, I, I talked my way through this. I'm going to go to screen share and I'm going to show you my PowerPoint as we go so that you can see some of these ideas. And I go here. So now you can all see it. You may, you may want to, oh, you may want to adjust your um, view of people just to not cover the PowerPoint. You can, you can adjust it so you just see me if you want to, or you could see a few people, it's up to you. Okay, so I'm going to adjust it so that um, I see Dennis and Libby. <laughs> okay, so, um, so this is my topic, we're wired to connect, and I'm going to go to the next one. Okay, so um, vertically, uh, Jews are tradition bound. We honor the teachings of our ancestors. Um, closer to home, we have the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. And according to um, the Torah, both in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, there are consequences for honoring father and mother. Um, one, the first one, honor your father and mother that your days may be long on the earth. So a long life is a consequence. And the second one is honor your father and mother that you may long endure, you live a long life, and you may fare well in the land. So it's a good life as well as a long life. These are the consequences of, um, of so the, remember the word consequence, because I think it's really important. And while we're on that vertical connection, especially between parents and children, I want to just um, mention that there's a lot of similarity between the Jewish view and the um, intergenerational family therapy point of view. So um, the Blame My Parents t-shirt that you see <clears throat> is a fairly standard fare for many people in our country. And frankly, it's, it's, it's also something that some therapists also um, endorse, which I don't, <laughs> which is it's always the parents' fault, okay? So um, family therapists note that if we carry a grudge or are stuck in a blame mode towards parents or are cut off from them, we're likely to carry that unfinished business or if we have unfinished business, into the next generation, into our relationship with our spouse or partner and our children. How we relate to our parents and to our past affects our current relationships in our own life. We are a bridge between the past and the future. I really like that image. So there's a real similarity from the family therapy point of view that how we relate to our parents, whether in real life, if they're still alive, or in our memories and in our hearts, affects actually how we're living now. So um, in addition to that vertical way of looking at Jewish connection, we look at the horizontal values. So the horizontal values in Judaism are very strong. Alti frosh min hatzibor, don't distance yourself from the community. We come together to pray, to eat together on Shabbos, et cetera. We daven in a minion of 10 people. Um, the idea, the, the, for the rabbis, the, the, the main action was in the Beit Midrash, in the study hall. And they learned in Chavruta in pairs. Um, and we also learn in Chavruta, many of us. I'm, I have a Chavruta, and um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a real privilege to have a Chavruta. Um, the rabbis learned, taught, agreed, disagreed, fought, always in dialogue with each other. And one of the famous stories from the Talmud, Choni Hamagel, he was a sort of a miracle worker who brought rain, because was, he drew a circle around himself and did some, some uh, great stuff that brought rain when they needed it. He was also our Rip Van Winkle. He fell asleep for 70 years, and when he woke up, <clears throat> no one recognized him in his family or in the study hall, even though they quoted his teaching. So he was very revered, but no one recognized him. They said, you, he said, I'm Coney. They said, no way. And he died on the spot. And the punchline of the story, according to the rabbis, is ochevruta omituta, either friendship or death. That's an incredibly powerful story in my view. We cannot live without friends. So let's compare the Jewish values with the dominant US cultural values. The dominant culture values in, in the United States, and I say dominant because there's a lot of um, subgroups in the United States and many of them don't adhere to these um, values. In addition to Jews, many Hispanics have a value of familismo, of closeness with the family. Many African-American families are close. So it's really more of a WASP point of view, but it is dominant. Um, the dominant culture cherishes individualism and independence. Um, the national mythic symbol is the American cowboy who rides off alone into the sunset. 
I like to sometimes imagine a debate between the, the American cowboy and the Jewish mother. And the American cowboy is like riding off into the sunset alone and the, and the Jewish mother is saying, could you please come and visit me, right? And you know, throwing in a little Jewish guilt maybe. The central value in the United States is individual rights. The central value in Judaism is responsibility, <clears throat> obligation toward the community and towards God, chiyuv and mitzvot. Our communal commitment is expressed in the phrase from the Talmud, kol Yisrael arevim zebazeh. We are co-responsible for each other. We are intertwined. This sense of responsibility fuels our moral stance in the world more broadly. Tikkun olam expresses our concern for social justice, from civil rights to poverty to inequality. It extends to caring for Mother Earth and ecology. This core Jewish value of co-responsibility, arevut, reflects a deep truth that is supported by current research in psychology and neuroscience. We humans are wired to connect, which was the title of one of my first articles on this subject. So way back when, a very long time ago, I don't know, 50 some years, 50 years ago-ish, I was in graduate school. I was a you know, wannabe psychologist. And the prevailing theory then was that while young children are dependent on their parents and need them to help grow them, um, development means you get more and more independent until you finally get to adulthood and then you stand on your own two feet. Um, this was very much in keeping with the myth of the self-made man or the American cowboy, right? You get to adulthood and then you're independent. But the current research on psychology and neurobiology paints a very different story. It turns out we never outgrow our need for social connection we need others throughout life, from the cradle to the grave. Dependence, or rather interdependence, in adulthood is not pathological, it's normal. Humans are social creatures. We are not meant to fly solo. We need others. Um, we crave love, support, and friendship. The myth of the autonomous individual, the cowboy, is not supported by current research. Having a good marriage or good friends predicts a longer life. So relationships get under our skin for better or worse and affect our health. There's a lot of data showing that positive relationships and social support contribute to our health. The Talmud was right in its maxim, o chavruta o mituta, either friendship or death. That's literally been proved by neuroscience. So when I was a graduate student just starting out, um, I, they knew nothing about the brain way back when in the ancient days. And we were taught that the brain is like a black box. There's a stimulus that goes in. We don't know what's going on inside the black box and a, and a response comes out. But now we know a lot more about what's going on in that black box inside the human brain. Thanks to technological advances like the fMRI, the functional MRI machine, they can see what's happening in your brain when you're scared or angry or happy or madly in love. And the action isn't just in the brain. The fee so that neuroscience studies the brain, in action. It, um, neurobiology studies the interplay between the brain and the body, and they're very closely connected. And interpersonal neurobiology looks at the interplay between brain, body, and relationships. And the research shows that we're affected for better or worse by our relationships. We are deeply social creatures. What happens when we're cut off from others? Neuroscientists did an experiment where they put people in the fMRI machine and they had them basically, um, through a, some complicated technology, they, had them they were playing a game of catch with other people, although it was all done by the computer. And then people stopped throwing them the ball. They were essentially rejected socially by the group. And what happened was these subjects, the physical brain, the physical pain centers of their brains lit up when they were socially rejected. It literally hurts to be rejected. And then they did a follow-up study giving people Tylenol, and they found that that, hurt, that cut down the pain of social rejection. So the moral of the story isn't that we should all say, take Tylenol when we feel alone or socially rejected. The moral of the story is that our social needs are primal and are key for physical and social well-being. They are key for our social well-being and emotional well-being. So let's come back to that article by Joe Lepore. <laughs> So first of all, before Lepore, and, and, and actually this research is, I think, part of what she addressed in the article, um, loneliness negatively affects our mental and physical health. The major researcher on this topic was Dr. John Cassiopo from the University of Chicago. I actually had the privilege to meet him before he passed away a few years ago. 
He was the founder of the field of social neuroscience, which looks at connections between people. And he wrote a book in 2008 called Loneliness, Human Nature and the Need for Social Connection, which is a terrific book. He and his colleagues found that loneliness is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and immune system problems, as well as for depression. <laughs> loneliness is not the same as being alone. And I think Laporte talks about this too. Many people choose solitude and find solace in alone time. That's not loneliness. Indeed, that's one of the opportunities of our current situation, finding ways to use our newfound solitude to grow personally and spiritually. And I'm gonna come back to that later. For some people that means reading novels or painting or knitting or cooking or meditating or taking online classes, davening at a slow pace at home. But unlike solitude that we cherish, loneliness is a feeling of isolation that is toxic. As Mother Teresa put it, loneliness and the feeling of being unwanted is the most terrible poverty. <clears throat> so some of you may have read Joe Lepore's article in the New Yorker. If you haven't, I imagine you will after tonight. Um, and it was that that sparked this series. Um, she talks in the book about a new book by Vivek Murthy. I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing his name right. He's a former Surgeon General of the United States and his brand new spanking new book is called Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World. Um, I got the book, but I also looked it up um, as a Kindle and I actually ended up getting it as a Kindle too. And in the Kindle, he wrote an author's, for, an author's word, prior, which was real, written after the book was already in press, but, but we could read it because it was on the Kindle. And he talked about how it, while the book was written and finished just before the pandemic, He's writing this author's word during, in March of 2020. And it really is so apt um, to think about this book uh, and the importance of connection as we're going through what we're going through. So social co co connection and evolution. Social connection is key to our evolutionary um, success and survival. As one neuroscientist put it, Lou Cozzolino, our social brains have been shaped by natural selection. In other words, our brains were, were shaped by natural selection, right, evolution, because our being social enhances survival. So many scientists believe that it's our social nature, not being smart and being able to create, you know, um, computers or whatever, but it's really being able to work together and live together and love together that um, is why we have been so successful. In human, um, early human prehistory, we lived in small groups. And it was absolutely crucial to know who was in your tribe and who was other, uh, potentially dangerous, because the other, if you stepped outside of your tribe, your area of safety, you could be killed. Many of our emotional and social skills developed in that context. Unlike other animals, the human child, as we well know, needs years of care before it can function or he or she can function on its own. The young child's brain is shaped through interactions with parents and caregivers. Attunement and attachment are key for successful development. We are wired to give and receive empathy, love, and care. So let's talk about empathy and compassion. Scientists put human subjects in an fMRI machine, again, that shows the brain in action, and show them a picture of a person in pain. In the fMRI, the pain centers in the subject's own brain lit up watching someone else suffering pain. We are wired to feel another person's pain as if it were our own. And that often leads to constructive action as we feel compassion and are moved to help others. As the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, one of my favorite writers, puts it, compassion is the quivering of the heart in the face of suffering. We are deep in our DNA wired for care and compassion, but there's a catch. We don't necessarily feel care and concern for somebody who's different from us. We are wired to differentiate us from them. If you are the subject lying in the fMRI machine and the person in pain you see is of a different race than you, your pain centers may not light up at all. Rather than feeling compassion, you may take pleasure in the other person's pain. Even at the brain level, humans differentiate us from them. We see this all too clearly in real life as we demonize the other. The Dalai Lama has noted that our care, compassion, and concern for our fellow creatures builds on our biological instinct to care for our own and protect our own, our spouse, our children, et cetera, our family, our tribe. 
the Dalai Lama suggests that we can widen the circle of we, the definition of we, to include people of different races, all people, animals, all of creation, the environment. And um, Albert Einstein had this great quote, which I'll read. A human being is part of the whole called by us universe. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. I love that term, optical delusion. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. So very similar to what the Dalai Lama was saying. Let's look a little bit at the neurobiology of empathy. So I'm gonna move my, um, the little video screen to, down to the bottom. Some of you may wanna do that so you can see the full picture. So um, the care and compassion we're talking about rests on the capacity for empathy. Our ability to read the emotions of others is key to our social survival, friend or foe. There are muscles around the eyes that specialize in communicating emotions. You can learn more about this if you go online and Google reading the mind through the eyes test. Um, this is devised by a specialist in autism called Simon Baron Cohen. He's actually the cousin of the wild actor and comedian, Sasha Baron Cohen. Um, and um, he's, he's as sober as his cousin is funny. Uh, and um, if, if you look up that, at that picture at the top of the screen, you see a woman, I think she's smiling, I think she's happy. And the way you know it is by the crinkles around her eyes, right? And so if you were taking this, reading the mind through the eyes test, there would be four uh, emotions listed, maybe happy, surprised, angry, suspicious. And then you would choose which one it is. In this case, it would be happy. I actually didn't get this picture from his website, from the Baron Cohen website. I got it from Google Images, and it's actually an image of an advertisement for Botox. Now, and think about what Botox does. It actually takes away those wrinkles and it deadens those muscles around the eyes. So the whole issue of how we're meant to communicate really is, um, is, is in that way. Okay. Um, so there are also neurons in the brain dedicated to reading others' emotions. Um, Simon, so, so uh, the, um, we, we, are, we are really meant to read others' emotions through the eyes. Empathy requires eye contact, so we can see those emotions in the eyes of the other. But what has happened in the world we live in even before COVID, the world, world of smartphones? You see that people don't look at each other in the eye anymore. When you looked, used to look at teenagers, now they're looking at each other on Zoom, but they used to look at, at, they used to be texting each other instead of looking at each other. And research shows that empathy has plummeted in recent decades in college students. That picture on the, on the bottom is really very poignant. It's a picture of a bride and groom and he's already on the phone right on the way back from the church to the celebration. Okay, I'm gonna go a little longer than nine, um, Dennis, since we started later, if that's okay with you. Okay, um, neurochemicals of connection versus stress. So um, the two major players in our well-being or stress are oxytocin and cortisol. Oxytocin has been called the love hormone or the bonding hormone. It bonds mothers and babies. And you have a picture of a mother and baby over there. Um, I won't say which one, but that's one of my sons and that's me hugging him. And um, the oxytocin was definitely flowing, I think, in both of us. Um, oxytocin also bonds lovers with each other. It's released with a hug, gentle touch, lovemaking, empathy. Oxytocin increases trust and it lowers cortisol, which is the stress hormone. Uh, cortisol is part of the fight or flight response and it uh, high cortisol levels, high stress levels negatively affects our health and our ability to learn. Many of us are managing our stress during this pandemic by connecting with others, releasing our inner oxytocin and finding ways to nurture well-being through social connection, also through exercise, healthy eating, et cetera. All of these help us settle down our nervous nervous system so we're not frantic 24-7 which is helpful to get through this long-term process. So we are wired for fight or flight like all other animals, but we're also like some mammals, we're wired for tend and befriend. We huddle together to help each other out. We're, we're wired for care and connection, which is shown in how we live, how we deal with COVID. We're wired to protect ourselves and each other by staying home and wearing masks. 
and you wear the mask, the, 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 the scientists are telling us that the masks don't necessarily protect you from what's coming from the outside, but it's protecting others from what you might be carrying. That's tendon to friend. And we reach out to others and we express our gratitude during this pandemic. So I'd like to talk about making meaning. What can we learn from this pandemic? It's hitting different populations, as we well know, with different intensity. People of color who don't have, <clears throat> who can't work from home, who live in overcrowded conditions, are homeless, et cetera, in prison, are all at higher risk, crowded together without proper protection. Those of us privileged to have a home in which to shelter, money to order groceries, wi fis to do Zoom, healthcare, et cetera, are definitely privileged, even though some of us are high risk. For many of us, fear has been the major um, emotion in this, in this pandemic. And it comes and goes, but we need to find a way to manage it. We also are aware of our sorrow. And, we, and I personally make room each day to hear some of the news that, that features some of the suffering that's going on, because I feel it helps me to hold the sorrow of other people, although I don't want to do it all day long. So some of you may know the song by Ishai Rebo. Um, and if you don't, you can contact me. I'm happy to give you the lyrics and also the link. Um, he's an Israeli singer who wrote this beautiful song called Keter Melucha. And he traces our lives from the joys in February of connection and birthday parties and regular life. My husband and I were in Florida in, in February having a grand old time. Um, COVID was very far away. Um, and then through Purim, where people, many people got infected, to complete social isolation, <clears throat> tracking the changes in our world from Parsha to Parsha, week to week, he asks in the refrain, Ma tarot what do you, God, want us to learn from this? Many of us are learning the value of connection, community, compassion, and co-responsibility for our life on the planet. The pandemic has taught us that we're not islands. We think about our larger community, our healthcare system, and how we're all interdependent. The, the couples therapist, Sue Johnson, says, we have built a culture of separateness that is at odds with our biology. Because all, we are all Arevim Zabazeh. We're all interconnected, intervulnerable, and interresponsible. Interresponsi In this pandemic, the flap of a butterfly wings far away has indeed created a worldwide tornado. For many of us, rethinking the individualistic assumptions of our culture is one of the positive, albeit painful, byproducts of this pandemic. Our interdependence leads us to consider our ethical co-responsibility for the planet. In addition to this ethical expansiveness, many of us are also using this quarantine as an opportunity to learn and grow intellectually and spiritually. I started learning Daf Yomi when it's, the cycle started, a page a day of the Talmud, well before the pandemic. I'm also taking umpteen Zoom classes, ranging from Hebrew poetry with Rachel Korazim, as many of you are, to classes on the Hasidic masters on the Sfat Emet. Recently in the Talmud and Daf Yomi, I read a page about chevruta, about study partners. And what this page taught us is that ideally chevruta partners challenge each other, sharpening their thinking, but they also listen to each other with respect and are open to learning from each other. And the rabbis tell us what, that when they are open to each other, the divine presence is in their midst. Having a close friend with whom we can explore texts and personal challenges, with whom we can enter into dialogue, not only increases oxytocin and lowers cortisol, it also invites the divine into our midst. Okay, Zoom. Zoom is a blessing, right? We're all relying on Zoom. It allows us to socially connect while distancing, but it has its limitations. So professors like my husband and like Dennis are teaching on Zoom and their students are, are in their homes, sometimes in their childhood bedrooms, struggling to keep up with class. Many people are experiencing Zoom fatigue. And it turns out it's a real thing, actually. People have been documenting it because our brains are wired for three-dimensional connection, not for the flat screen. But we are adapting because we want to be able to connect as best we can. Then there's the question that actually Dennis raised with me. How much of that oxytocin boost do we get from connectivity online? You know, when we hug each other, we get a spike of oxytocin. When we hug our dog, we get a spike of oxytocin, and so does the dog. Do we get that through online connection? I believe we do, but not as much as the real thing. But eye contact, again, is absolutely key. So finding balance. In our pre-pandemic lives, we, some of us are more introverts, some of us are more extroverts. We find a balance between solitude and togetherness. Um, and now we've really had to think about that more consciously. 
I love being with my dialogue partners. I love going to lunch with a friend and, and really talking about things in depth. And in the olden days when we could go out to restaurants in Teaneck, hopefully that will come back someday. I love snuggling with my grandchildren, playing Scrabble or hide and seek with them or reading a book. So we can't do that now, but we can reach out to friends and many of us are. Other ways we balance are we're balancing on the one hand, holding that sorrow and anxiety I was talking about. <clears throat> on the other hand, gratitude and joy. Gratitude to those who are making it possible for us to be safe and joy in terms of what we're learning during this period. Um, how much news do we watch? Do we balance that with inspiring concerts or other things that, that are funny or healing for us? How do we balance self-care versus caring for others? Many of my friends are babysitting their young grandchildren all day long. And how do we do that and also take care of ourselves? And finally, how do we balance helplessness versus mastery? We really need a roadmap for COVID and we're unfortunately not quite there yet. So I wanna finally say this, um, before COVID, I was hot on the trail of wisdom. In these later years of my life, I happened upon the book Wise Aging by, um, by uh, Rachel Dave, by, I'm sorry, by, by uh, Rachel Cowan and Linda Thal. And I, um, when we came to Teaneck, I was in a wonderful wise aging group with Elaine Cohen and Rachel David. And then um, Toby Glick and I became co-facilitators of wise aging groups at the JCC, which we're now meeting with um, online on Zoom. Wise aging acknowledges losses, whether from aging or from COVID now, while encouraging us to develop resources of resilience in our lives. Um, I've been um, doing the, 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 re the recovery or the, the self-isolation at home for more months than you guys because I broke my hip in September and I was more or less at home with the break in February in Florida. So I've learned a lot about surviving and thriving um, at home. And one of the most important um, sort of survival strategies for me has been the wise aging principles, particularly cultivating me dote of gratitude, generosity, patience, and equanimity. So now I'd like it to us to open this up for discussion. I'm going to stop share. And um, let's reflect on what sources of real resilience are you drawing on to get through these difficult times? <clears throat> what sources of inspiration are you finding that help you not only survive, but also thrive? How are you weathering the storm? How are you learning and growing in the context of COVID? And how can Jewish values help us grow and cope in these uncertain times? <clears throat> 